Students in New Brunswick call for action as hateful and sexually explicit mass emails target a young woman. One was too many, two was too many, three was too many, and this is just absurd. He has proved that he is unqualified and unfit. Contact with Russia puts pressure on another Trump cabinet member. I have recused myself uh, in the matters uh, that deal with the Trump campaign. Fresh questions about the Kremlin and the White House. And stop the presses. The NDP finally has a leadership race. As for the Conservatives, what exactly was this video all about? At issues here for that. And Rex will be by as well. He's got a story about bowling. That's right, bowling. They are disturbing messages and sexually explicit images sent to shame, shock, and taunt. A New Brunswick University student is being targeted online with malicious emails sent to thousands of her peers through the university's email system. Harry Forrestell has the details. Students at the University of Moncton are frightened and angry. One of their own is being victimized by someone online who's using the university's own email system to send sexually explicit photos and videos of the victim to thousands of students and staff. I would say it's sexual harassment, it's cyberbullying, it's cyber violence. Whatever word you want to use, it's wrong. But I just want her to know that she has support and that uh, the, what she's going through is completely unacceptable. The attacks began over the weekend. Eight emails in all sent to students and faculty accusing the female victim of cheating on the sender and including naked photos clearly meant to shame. I just want to know if the person doing this in front of a camera on the internet respects herself, one email says. Another says the sender wants to show the reality of this girl who is acting as an innocent person. There are also veiled threats to the university. This is just a warning for the University of Moncton because I'm coming back to play with you guys. See you around. This is uh, online sexual exploitation. It's sexual assault with technology. Cybersecurity expert David Chipley says such attacks are all but impossible to defend against. There's no internet off switch. Short of turning email off completely from the internet inbound to their institution, there's no way to prevent the abuse of their infrastructure. That's what student representatives are demanding. Lock down the school's email system to prevent more messages from getting through. But the university's vice chancellor says that would be giving in. As a university, as a place of freedom of expression, we have to make sure that we can keep communicating, that students can keep talking with each other, that we can keep working. The victim is receiving counseling and she's asked police to lay charges. Easier said than done. It's one thing to determine from which computer that uh, the email came, but we still have to prove who was behind the computer at that time. So it's all part of the investigation at that time. And yes, it takes time. It takes time. The university has confirmed the IP address on the emails is somewhere in Europe. The RCMP say they've identified one suspect, but as of yet, they haven't been able to reach him. Harry Forrestell, CBC News, Fredericton. Montreal police have laid charges in connection with a bomb hoax against Concordia University. A 47-year-old man is accused of targeting Muslim students in a threatening email. Classes have resumed, but as Alison Northcott reports, some students remain on edge. Early this morning, police arrested 47-year-old Hisham Saadi after tracking a threatening email to an IP address at this apartment building. K-9 unit, the SWAT team, the intervention group and lots of police officers came to the address. They evacuated at least 30 persons for their security. The investigator searched the apartment and we didn't find any explosive. This afternoon, Saadi appeared by video link at the Montreal courthouse to face three charges, hoax regarding terrorist activity, uttering threats and mischief. He told me he's a PhD uh, student uh, he's, uh, in economics. This man says he sublet uh, his apartment to Saadi and that police first arrested him. We've agreed to conceal his identity. Then they explained to me later that it was the IP address uh, of the internet uh, in that apartment. Then I explained that I, I'm just renting it. I haven't been there since beginning of February. 
After yesterday's threats, which made specific complaints about Muslim students, Concordia evacuated three buildings. Police searched them but found nothing. The university reopened last night and some students returned with a sense of unease. As I arrived, I honestly started feeling my heart pounding and I even said it to my friends, I do not feel safe. The university says it's trying to calm those fears. We did up our security, so there is uh, there are more agents on the campus and that's not because of a, of a perceived additional threat, but more to provide a sense of comfort to our community. The threats came during Islamic Awareness Week at the school and the Muslim Students Association says regardless of who was behind them, they're now part of an important discussion. This will only open the door for more people to ask questions and the more questions mean more people enjoying, more bonds built, more connections. He and other students here say they feel safe at their school, especially after an outpouring of support from fellow students and staff. Saadi is scheduled to appear in court again tomorrow for a bail hearing and he's been ordered to undergo a psychological evaluation. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. A Nova Scotia judge has sparked outrage over comments he made during a sexual assault trial. The case centered on the issue of consent, whether an intoxicated person can give it. The judge says yes. Tom Murphy has more on the controversy. The story begins here in 2015. Police found a 26-year-old woman unconscious and almost nude in the back seat of a cab. The driver, Bassem El Rawi, had her underwear in his hands and testing would later show he had her DNA on his lip. She testified she was so drunk she didn't even remember getting into the cab. But yesterday, Judge Gregory Lenahan acquitted El Rawi, saying a lack of memory does not equate to a lack of consent. And while he said an intoxicated person must have, quote, an operating mind, he went on to say clearly a drunk can consent. The outrage has been swift. That a drunk yes is a big no, um, and we expect everyone to understand that. Staff at this organization that supports sexual assault survivors worry this case could prevent other victims of sexual assault from coming forward. It's really saying that the judicial system is not supporting survivors. It's not there to listen to their stories and to give them the, the, the verdict that they need, um, and it is deserved, uh, which is really disappointing. Experts say incapacitation, as seen under the law, is not clear. Our criminal law and sexual assault law has not defined a very clear uh, line as to when intoxication or incapacitation crosses into incapacity to consent. So we don't have clear legal, medical or expert standards on that very issue. No matter. The local cab drivers association has banned Al Rawi. If anybody sees me driving a road cab, we'll certainly report them immediately to 911. There's no maybes, um, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. Others have suggested mandatory security cameras in cabs. We need to get to the point of cab drivers should not be sexually assaulting their passengers. That's the starting point, not cameras in cabs. The Crown is considering appealing the case. An online petition calling for an inquiry into how the judge handled the trial grows as protests are already planned for next week. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. Two Alberta sisters missing for more than 30 years have been found alive in the U.S. Anna and Kim Haxa were estranged from their family when they disappeared. In 2003, we, met, uh, we received from the mother of uh, both daughters uh, missing an official missing per persons report. They were actually last seen in the mid-80s in Edmonton. So in 2003, we actively started investigating the file. Police even looked into the possibility that the women may have been victims of serial killer Robert Picton. The sisters, now 53 and 67 years old, were finally tracked down after a fingerprint match. Their location and new names are being kept private. For another member of Donald Trump's administration, the question is once again, did he tell the truth? Trump has already fired Mike Flynn, his first national security advisor, over not disclosing a conversation with the Russian ambassador. Now his attorney general, Jeff Sessions, is being accused of misleading Congress about a conversation with that same diplomat. Today, Sessions said he will recuse himself from any investigation into the controversy that is hanging over all of this. Allegations that President Trump and his officials are beholden to Moscow.
Paul Hunter has the latest from Washington. Just when you might have thought the controversy dogging Donald Trump over his alleged ties with Russia couldn't get more dramatic, now his attorney general, Jeff Sessions, is implicated and under fire. For the good of the country, Attorney General Sessions should resign. He has proved that he is unqualified and unfit to serve in that position of trust. Sessions was a key campaign advisor for Donald Trump, including at precisely the time it's now alleged Russia was interfering with the U.S. election. With talk of all that meddling swirling, Sessions was asked in January, under oath, what would he do as attorney general if he learned anyone acting on behalf of Trump's campaign had communicated with Moscow. I'm not aware of um, any of those activities. I have been called a surrogate at a time or two in that campaign, and I didn't have not have communications with the Russians. But it's now emerged Sessions himself met with the Russian ambassador during the campaign, twice. The same ambassador, whose conversation with Trump's now former national security advisor, Mike Flynn, led to his firing last month. Sergei Kislyak, who, adding to the intrigue, is reportedly himself a top Russian spy, denied today by Russia. Stop spreading lie and false news. Just as all the reports about Jeff Sessions raged in Washington. Jeff Sessions has to go. With demonstrators also demanding he step aside. Meanwhile, the president was touring an aircraft carrier in Virginia. To the question, does he still have confidence in Sessions? Trump gave a one-word answer. Total. All of it leading to a late afternoon news conference by the attorney general and a full-on denial. Let me be clear. I never had meetings with Russian operatives or Russian intermediaries about the Trump campaign. There were meetings, he said, but on other matters, terrorism, Ukraine. So that answer he gave under oath was... Honest and correct as I understood it at the time. Sessions did cede to one demand by his critics today, recusing himself from any investigations into that alleged Russian meddling in the election. Investigations he would have overseen. The recusal, he said, was recommended today by those at the Justice Department. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Concerns about Russian intentions are especially strong in Europe. Today, Sweden announced it will reintroduce conscription due to Russian military activity in the region and because of Russia's annexation of Crimea. 4,000 Swedish men and women will be called into military service beginning next January. Sweden last had conscription in 2010. It is not a member of NATO, but the alliance is also ramping up its military presence along the Russian border. Canada will lead a multinational force in Latvia later this year. And NATO troops are also being deployed to Estonia, Lithuania and Poland. The missions were agreed upon last summer, again in response to the annexation of Crimea. Coming up, the Thursday night lineup is ready. Andrew, Chantel, and Althea on the state of the races in the two opposition parties. And it's all strikes for Rex, both just minutes away. Plus, during our second break, an online-only Q&A. We're taking your questions on Facebook Live. Vandalism at a Jewish cemetery in Philadelphia prompted a few thousand people to gather today for a rally with a strong message for their city and their country. Stand against hate. As the CBC's Stephen D'Souza reports, in the U.S., anti-Semitic incidents and other hate crimes are adding up. After almost daily incidents of anti-Semitic threats and vandalism across the U.S., hundreds gathered for a rally of solidarity today in Philadelphia. These acts of hatred are absolutely, positively wrong. And they have no place in Pennsylvania, and they have no place in this nation. Philadelphia was home to one of the worst incidents, where more than 100 tombstones were toppled at a Jewish cemetery. Nationwide, there have been more than 200 anti-Semitic incidents since the beginning of the year. On Monday alone, 30 Jewish community centers and schools were threatened. It's not clear if all the threats are connected. 
Here in New York, the NYPD says hate crimes are up overall, and the number of anti-Semitic incidents has nearly doubled compared to this time last year. I think this is New York Rabbi Mark Wilds blames the divisive election rhetoric for giving license to racists to act out. I think there's something real happening, and I don't think it's limited to the Jewish community. I think racism and bigotry is broader than anti-Semitism. The spate of incidents has brought some communities closer together. A fundraiser to help the Jewish cemeteries by two Muslim groups passed their initial goal of $20,000 in just three hours. They've now raised more than $150,000. We live in times where we, all the minorities and a lot of groups need to stand together against all forms of racism. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo promised $25 million for security upgrades at Jewish centers statewide. The FBI is investigating, and the Department of Homeland Security has promised to help Jewish centers increase their readiness. President Trump, meanwhile, has been criticized for not saying enough, though he addressed the issue this week. We are a country that stands united in condemning hate and evil in all of its very ugly forms. Wilde says it's not enough for the president to say his daughter and son-in-law, his closest advisor, are Jewish. He needs to do more. Our history has taught us that when these threats are made, you have to take them seriously. He says it would go a long way to helping reassure a community on edge. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. With a sudden spotlight this year on asylum seekers crossing the border from the U.S. into Canada, it seems as if there has been a spike prompting concerns going forward. Today, the government responded to those concerns and tried to reassure Canadians that it's not a crisis. The CBC's Katie Simpson has more. These dramatic scenes of people making the dangerous trek into Canada have captured the attention of the country. And while illegal border crossings are on the rise, government officials downplayed concerns today, showing the increase appears to be minor. Between January 1st and February 21st, 435 people crossed illegally into Canada. Most of the activity is happening in Quebec, with entries also taking place in Manitoba and British Columbia. If this pace continues, just over 2,600 asylum seekers will enter Canada illegally in 2017, slightly above the nearly 2,500 people from last year. Government officials also say they have no intelligence to suggest that when the wintry weather moves out, more people will risk the trip to Canada, a claim not everyone is buying. If the situation in the U.S. politically does not improve, it's only rational to think that when the weather improves and people are able to cross more easily that they will do so. Despite government assurances, the United Way in Winnipeg is expecting a spring surge and is appealing for public support. With more families expected as warmer weather approaches, making the need to help now greater than ever. The Prime Minister, who was in B.C. meeting with members of the Navy, congratulated first responders for supporting the asylum seekers. But Justin Trudeau was vague when asked if the government is doing anything to discourage illegal border entry. We need to make sure that the law is being enforced. Uh, we are continuing to monitor and work with uh, different orders of government and international partners. Even if the increase surpasses what government officials expect, Amnesty International says Canada is in a good position to welcome more refugees. This pales dramatically to what many other countries around the world, including Europe, uh, face in terms of a refugee influx. While it is against the law to enter Canada at any of these unmarked border crossings, government officials confirmed no charges have been laid against any of the asylum seekers. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Syria's military says it has once again recaptured the ancient city of Palmyra from ISIS militants. This military video purportedly shows Syrian forces approaching Palmyra. ISIS has razed ancient Roman temples and monuments. The United Nations has condemned the destruction as a war crime. Former Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak was taken from a military hospital today to the country's highest appeals court. He was acquitted of being involved in the killings of protesters during the 2011 uprising against his 30-year rule. And in China, air pollution has some lawyers suing the governments of Beijing and surrounding areas for not getting rid of the choking smog. Their latest list of compensation demands includes the cost of face masks 
doctor's visits, and emotional distress. Augmented reality hit Wall Street with a sharp snap today. The company behind Snapchat, a popular social media app, went public. It's the biggest share offering in the tech sector in three years. Rene Filipponi tells us how it went down with investors. It's the most anticipated tech company to sell its first shares in years. And today, Snapchat grabbed the attention of traders. Its value surged up nearly 45 percent when markets closed today. There's two things you need in, in the Internet these days. You have to be useful or you have to be entertaining, and Snapchat is both those things. The app has more than 150 million users worldwide. Its value on the stock market soared to more than 25 billion U.S. dollars. That's a lot for a company that is actually losing money and whose number of new users is slowing down. Investors are buying it not based on what it's worth now, but its potential value. It's a risk. We've seen MySpace, which was a big network for a long time, and Friendster, and I can go on. There's, there's, there's several others, even Google+, Plus, which is a, a big company that couldn't actually pull it off. The app is especially popular with teenagers and younger millennials. Crazy filters let them take selfies to the next level, then send those messages called snaps to friends, and they can disappear after they've been watched. But competition in the social media world is fierce, and other apps are aggressively competing with and copying Snapchat's features. Facebook is coming directly after Snapchat. They tried to buy them several years ago, and there's you know ongoing rumblings that uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, would uh, would like to in some some way put put Snap out of business. Um, so clearly, you're seeing you're seeing that uh, that competition uh, very directly. I use it to keep in touch with my friends, uh, see what other people are up to. Uh, you know, send selfies, I guess. We can take a selfie right now. The snapper says he likes the app now, but is not betting on its future. Things change pretty quickly, but I think Snapchat's uh, pretty solidly embedded in things. So I have a, I'm, I think I will be using it in five years from now, but like I wouldn't put money on it. The future for Snapchat will be whether it can evolve, get more users fast and turn a profit. And at least for today, Wall Street believes it can. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Toronto. Facing low approval ratings and serious political backlash over soaring electricity costs, Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne has announced a relief plan. By the summer, the province says the new initiative will save Ontario residents an average of 25% on their bills. But it comes at a future cost. The plan is based on stretching the financing for building and refurbishing power plants which means an additional $1.4 billion in interest costs a year. Air Canada has weighed in on a CBC News investigation that revealed airlines get a cut of the airport improvement fees added to the cost of tickets. For example, in Halifax, 6% of the $25 fee, or $1.50 per ticket, goes to airlines. Not just to Air Canada, but to WestJet and others too to cover the cost of collecting and remitting the fee. Today, Air Canada said it does not make a profit from the fee because of costs incurred in the reporting and auditing process, as well as credit card charges and foreign exchange fluctuations. After the break, the state of two races to lead the Conservatives and the NDP. At issue, just ahead.
So if you've been sitting at the edge of your seat wondering if there was ever going to be a race for Tom Mulcair's job, well, you can sit back and relax now because there is one. That's topic one tonight. Andrew and Althea are here in Toronto. Chantel is actually trapped by the windy weather in Montreal tonight, but we're still hooked up with her. Let me show you who's in the race for the NDP after this kind of week one already. We have three officially in. There they are. First timers running for the leadership. Nikki Ashton is expected to get in in the, uh, the next few days. And she, of course, ran against Tom Mulcair. So there's your opening lineup. Four in the NDP leadership race. Do, do those four, Andrew, tell us anything about the direction this party may be heading in? Well, it tells you that there's more than zero, which is what they had until quite recently. And I think that's, to some extent, an indication that NDP fortunes are a little better now than they were maybe six months ago. The Liberal government, when it first came in, was really sucking all the oxygen out of the left side of the spectrum. I think there's more disenchantment on the left now with some of the things the government has done, particularly, for example, reneging on electoral reform. And maybe that may be why we're starting to see more of these candidates coming in, maybe a couple more in the next few weeks. Um, but also, you know, you're going to see a range, as you see any time there's a Liberal, uh, I should say, an NDP leadership race, there's always these permanent divisions within the party between urban and rural, between establishment and grassroots. More recently, you know, some differences of, of direction between Quebec and the rest of the country. So the candidacies will reflect some of that. Chantal? Well, uh, let me make a prediction. There will not be 14 of them. <laughs> uh, so, so they should be able to have debates where we, you actually have a chance to see who's saying what uh, divides. I'm curious to see uh, if any of these candidates will be trying to fight for the Malcare legacy of moving closer to the center or whether they will all back off uh, and disown uh, the platform from the last election, which they all defended, of balanced budgets uh, go down the line, a so-so position on pipelines. I'm not sure that these divisions will emerge. I, I think they're all going to walk away from that legacy, but it remains to be seen. Uh, Althea, only four in the race, well, three plus one expected in the next day or so, but it doesn't mean there aren't going to be more because there are some other names being mentioned here. Sid Ryan, uh, Jack Meetson, which we talked about a few months ago, but uh, the Ontario MPP for the NDP, who there's a lot of buzz about him, um, but he is, I think, waiting to see what's going on with the Ontario landscape and whether the NDP provincially have a shot of forming government. Um, I think his name would inject a bit of excitement, but he isn't part of that establishment crew that we have right now. And to Shanta's point, the people who are running are far more left of the spectrum than Mr. Mulcair was. So far, Peter Julian has announced that he's against against any crude oil pipelines at all. Uh, Guy Cajon has announced that if he was elected, they would have a minimum basic income for every Canadian across the country. Nikki Ashton was uh, actually forthright about how uncomfortable she was during the last election with the Mulcair platform. Big Bernie Sanders supporter. I think we're going to really see a shift of the party to the left. What do you like about this race, Andrew, and the way it'll be conducted, as opposed to the the people. It's, it's a very different kind of race than what we're seeing unfold on the conservative side in terms of the way it's being done. Well, the, the format is very interesting. Yeah, they're going to have a, a successive rounds of voting, as we're familiar with from other previous leadership races, except they're going to have a week in between each round. So as each candidate drops out and his, his or her votes are then up for grabs, you're going to see, I think, a really quite exciting uh, interval there where everyone's uh, pushing and shoving and arm twisting to trying to get them to come to their side. And also, I think, uh, just to pick on the point made previously, this is a time now for the party to, to trot out some new ideas to try and reinvigorate itself. And that's good, whatever your perspective, right or left, it's good to see people debating new ideas, fresh new ideas, like, for example, the, the basic income idea. All right. Let me show you the, the Conservatives as it sits right now, because they're still sitting with 14 candidates. There's there are seven of them and another seven. So it's, uh, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of people, and the people haven't been dropping out, as some thought they might. They've all ponied up to the bar with their money. They all appear to be in it for the long run. Uh, if they are, Althea is going to cause a problem for starters with the ballot, is it not? Well, the ballot has only space for members to rank 
10 names. So there are still going to be 14 candidates, but the ballot will only have 10 names. So once that first round is announced, there will be a lot of people who have a lot less support than perhaps you expected. And we saw Lisa Raitt, for example, say after the Edmonton convention that it was time for about seven of the candidates to take a real hard look and look at their fundraising numbers, look at the membership they've sold, and decide. And she actually said she includes herself in this list whether or not, for the good of the party, they should stay in the race. Chantel, it doesn't appear, at least so far, that any of them are, are doing that. Well, uh, they've all paid up, right? And mm -hmm. they're not getting a refund, uh, as far as I understand, if they leave now. So presumably, someone who didn't want to campaign all that much, just go to the uh, party debates, would not have to spend a lot of money, could stay on the ballot and try to parley that bid that he's paid or she's paid for into influence. I know it doesn't sound like a very big plan, but you have to think, looking at the numbers, that there must be some of those people who realize that they are not going to get anywhere near the front of the pack, even if there's a lot of maneuvering with second and third choices. And they will be uh, four of them uh, in those unnamed people that might not even get, you know, beyond uh, having run. Andrew, well, let me ask the same question I asked about the NDP. In terms of trying to understand where this party is at, in terms of its thinking, the direction it's heading, is there any clear indication of that yet, or are, they, or are the 14 just so different that you can't get that sense? I think there's some uh, common themes, not with every single candidate, but generally common themes that have emerged. One is that, that they need to redress some of the excesses of the Harper government in terms of tone, the harshness of tone, the excessive partisanship, the, the apparent targeting of immigrant groups or selected immigrant groups. Uh, I think there's a, a sense that from among most of the candidates that that was part of the reason they lost the last election. There certainly seems to be a strong consensus among all but one that they don't want to go the carbon tax route. So that's become a big cheering point. Um, or a booing I, point. A booing point, exactly. <laughs> and I think there's also a sense, uh, and maybe also coming out of the Harper experience, that, that um, the social conservatives are going to have a bit more of a place within the party. There's only a couple of candidates who are avowedly running on a social conservative platform. But you're seeing some of the other candidates saying, you know what? We're not going to try and suppress these voices. We're going to let them have a vote, for example, on abortion if, the, if, they, if a private member's bill comes forward, these kinds of things. So they're not going to take a stand as a party on that, but they're not going to try and sort of shun them the way they, they might have been in the past. I think that's been a consensus as well. There are obviously very different tacks that some of the candidates are taking. Uh, uh, Maxime Bernier has staked out a very strong uh, free market turf, for example. Michael Chong is the only candidate talking about the carbon tax. Each of them, you see this in the debates, the line, I'm the only candidate who, mm -hmm. constantly comes up because you're trying to sort of stake out that, that place in the marketplace. Uh, but the biggest, the only thing I think that has potential to divide the party is on this question of of how big a constituency out there is there for the sort of Muslim bashing, anti-immigrant, populist, Donald Trump, if you will, type of message that's definitely out there on the fringe. I don't think anybody knows how big a force it is, but you can see some of the candidates angling towards that group for that support and other candidates warning very strongly we can't go down that road. Althea, the, Kevin O'Leary made a few headlines the other day by not turning up at the Edmonton bait, uh, which you were at. He said it was because there are too many in the race. Um, others said it, it was because it was a bilingual debate yeah. and, and his French is an issue, as is for many of the other candidates. But in terms of this issue of too many to have a real proper debate, has he got a point? Yes and no. I, I think that if you had fewer candidates, you would have a chance to uh, more clearly identify their weaknesses and their strengths and be able to compare them against each other. But I think the wide breadth of candidates allows you to see who the membership of the Conservative Party is and allows members to see themselves reflected in that party. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think that was fine for the first few months. But I think in hindsight, if they were redesigning this race, you might have maybe had a preliminary round of voting round about now to winnow out, let's say, down to seven candidates. So then you can have that focus. Like I agree. A primary system. It's, it, exactly. It's great to have that diverse range of candidates uh, for, the, for all those reasons. But at some point, you've got to narrow it down. But I think, uh -huh. you know, to that point, and to Chantal's earlier point, I think there might be people who are not completely delusional, like Rick Peterson, who insists, the Vancouver businessman, who insists he has a shot. But 
uh, people who do not want to embarrass themselves, like Mark Garneau in the Liberal leadership race, who pulled out before his meager vote total would be announced to the country. So I think that there might be people like Lisa Raitt who decide, mm, maybe maybe I don't want to go all the way to the end. All right, I'm, I'm running out of time, but Chantel, I want you to handle this one. I'm going to play a, a little bit of video oh, here you. from the 22 Minutes program. <laughs> Uh, this week, politics can be a mean business, and uh, uh, you know sometimes you set yourself up to have mean things said about you. Uh, Kelly Leach's video this week, uh, everybody seemed to make fun of it. Mark Critch certainly did on 22 Minutes. Uh, he said it looked like she was being held hostage. Did this skit with a voice of the hostage taker in the background? Watch this. And it is the reason why I'm running for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada. Read it. Canada is an opportunity. I said read it. An opportunity to work hard. Do what I say. And provide for oneself and one's family. Good job. Don't worry, Kelly. I've contacted the Minister of Defense, Harjit Sajjan, and he will rescue you. He is Sikh, though, so don't be afraid of him. He's been pre-screened. Vicious, Mark Critch. But, you know, somebody must have told Kelly Leach that that, that, that video was going to work for her, that it, you know, that it looked good. Chantal, I, how I, could something like that happen? I don't... Well, how could Stéphane Zion, who <laughs> was uh, designated as Prime Minister, have gone to the nation with a, a, a recording that didn't look as bad as that, but almost? Uh, and how could anyone around him tell him this will inspire a lot of confidence in a coalition government that you look like you're a skit from this hour is 22 minutes, Mr. Zion. So uh, that tells you something about the group think that is around the candidate or about the fact that they've given up uh, on this campaign. But there is one thing, whether you agree or not with uh, Kelly Leach's campaign team. There is one thing that I found that party members in any party cannot stand, and it is to feel embarrassed by the person that they would otherwise back. And on that basis, uh, whether there were 50,000 or a million hits on this, this was bad for Kelly Leach. All right. Going to close out on something we haven't done for a while where we pick. Uh, we see pictures of leaders who are campaigning using ordinary people as props in the background for them. It's you know, we think that's not a good thing. Two of them today. There is uh, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, at the CFB Esquimalt in uh, BC today, using the props in the background and, and a bit of a uniform on himself. Uh, and Donald Trump today on board a uh, US uh, aircraft carrier uh, with uh, his props in the background, both of them wearing nice uniform jackets. All right, thank you both. <laughs> Althea and Andrew here in Toronto, Chantel in Montreal. Coming up next, Rex, where do you hear what he's talking about tonight? One of the great stories of our time, sadness and triumph, comes out of juvenile Newfoundland bowling. That's coming up later on The National. Hello there, Facebook fans. Back with you again for the next uh, three to four minutes. First of all, the Ad Issue team, we, we taped Ad Issue about an hour ago. Althea was uh, catching a flight to Ottawa, so we put that uh, in the can, as they say, about an hour ago, and uh, Rex will be up in a couple of minutes. So, uh, your questions uh, in this feature that we started a week or so ago, and as often as we can do it. Uh, there appear to be a lot of questions tonight, so let me get to them quickly in the short time we have. Brian Charette, if you could redo an interview, which one would it be and why? That's easy. Uh, listen, there are lots of interviews I'd like another run at, but Margaret Thatcher, about 1994, she, like, killed me. It was bad. Luke Moe, what's your favorite pizza? What are your thoughts on pineapple on pizza? You're getting right to the, like, substantive stuff, eh, Luke? I, I like pineapple on pizza. Matthew Lose, how will new jobs be created in the new digital economy? Okay, that's the, <laughs> that's the reverse. That's very substantive. Whole courses are taught on that at university. So I'm not going to be able to squeeze a, a, an answer in, in, into this spot, but I can tell you we're working on different ways of trying to tell you that story because I know it's important to you and a lot of other people. Uh, and we will keep working on that, uh, perhaps in terms of a, a series in the, in the near future. Uh, Peter C., ever keep any snacks <laughs> under the table? Uh, no, uh, don't eat during the show. Sarah Taylor. Peter, what's your greatest hope for the future of our global community? 
Boy, I mean, we all have great hopes and dreams about, you know, peace in our time and, and all that. I, I, I think, you know, hel helping each other, and that could be on an individual basis or on a country-to-country -country basis, I, I hope we can all, you know, do better on that. <laughs> Where did you get your tie, Peter? I'm not... <laughs> Dietrich Lisnick. I'm not going to tell you, Dietrich. I'm not going to plug some store. But I'll tell you, I've been shopping the same place for suits and ties since 1988, small, independent run by two great young guys. Well, they were young when we started shopping there, uh, since 1988 uh, here in Toronto. Um, Dadir Hassan, have you ever reported from a combat zone and how did you feel? We're all trained, most of us who, who might find ourselves in those positions, uh, to go into difficult uh, situations. I've been in combat zones in uh, Afghanistan and uh, uh, in, uh, in the Middle East uh, during the Intifada. I can remember being pulled out of an open window by Neil McDonald. I was stupidly sort of, you know, at, at the edge of a window and there was a kind of a gun battle going on right outside and Neil sort of pulled me aside and, and, and kind of said, hey, you know, that's really stupid, which it was. Um, Liz Dion, what's been your most memorable story to cover and why? So many, really, when you've been in this business as long as I have, 50 years now, uh, there are a lot of great stories. My most memorable one, I think, one minute, Al? Okay. Uh, was going through the Northwest Passage on a Canadian icebreaker. And, you know, I've been around the world, I've seen a lot of things, good things, bad things, but that one was stunning, doing that uh, four or five days. Some of you may remember our live coverage from there. Name, uh, name someone, perhaps previously passed, who you wish you could have interviewed. No argument here, Winston Churchill. I wish I'd had that opportunity, so much to learn from that that man. Um, how do you plan to celebrate Canada's 150th anniversary? Think about the country every day and uh, be there on July 1st for the big uh, special out of Ottawa. Have you ever walked away from a story or recused yourself for any reason? Um, don't think so, but I'm Chancellor of Mount Allison University, so I'd never do a story on Mount A. Uh, only got a few seconds left before Rex comes up. Thanks for your questions. We'll keep doing it. Rex is up in three. It's terrible when heroes disappoint, and especially when the heroes are sports figures. Nearly a full hundred years ago, the baseball legend, Shoeless Joe Jackson, reputedly testified he was one of the eight who fixed the World Series. As Shoeless Joe left the courthouse, a tearful young boy reportedly ran up to his hero and uttered the most plaintive cry in all sports history. Say it ain't so, Joe. Say it ain't so. There have been other such moments. Lance Armstrong, Superman of the Tour de France, lying his way through championships and then proven to be more pumped up than the Goodyear blimp. Tiger Woods, not content with fame and fortune, threw it all away when it was revealed he did just as much record-setting putting off the course as on, a champ in the cat house and the clubhouse. They destroyed themselves, but now a reverse fable out of Newfoundland, the yarn of a seven-year-old boy, a bowling wonder kid with a look straight from Norman Rockwell, and it has more medals than an old-fashioned convent. Grayson Powell played the best three games of his entire career at a tournament this weekend and was actually lined up to receive the gold medal when his mother was called into a supervisor's office and told it was all off. Seven-year-old bowling wizard Grayson was found guilty of wearing illegal pants. Illegal pants, the deflate gate of Newfoundland bowling. The young athlete's life in Newfoundland is a hard one. At five, you're promising. Six, you're a hero. And washed up at seven. Score your best ever, but put on the wrong pants, and it's game over. Now, this was not a spur-of-the-moment decision. The tournament supervisor sent three to four more supervisors to go and look at the pants on the other teams and advise him of their thoughts. That would be, I should point out, the thoughts of the supervisors, not the thoughts of the pants. Pants are not introspective. For you see, Newfoundland juvenile bowling has a rule about black pants. Grayson's pants were originally black, but they'd faded. So after mighty deliberations, it was ruled they were not dark enough. 
So Grayson's team was disqualified, his mother in tears, his father outraged, fans perplexed, possible endorsements, KFC, Purity Biscuits, wing passed. If King Lear had wandered into that bowling alley at that moment with the dead Cordelia in his arms, no one would have noticed. It was just that sad. But as the UK Guardian newspaper and the Washington Post noted, this story, by the way, is bigger than Trump, wiser hearts prevailed. Grayson, while still under the asterisk of wearing illegal pants, will get a medal for his performance. And so Mercy has put on her bowling shoes and scored a strike for justice. And in Newfoundland, thank God, bowling has regained its honor. For The National, I'm Rex Murphy. This is Niagara Falls, and if you've noticed a little more foam at its base lately, perhaps it's mainly because of the beer. Beer that's being dumped by the caseload into the custom shed washroom upriver at Fort Erie. They are bringing more beer than usual on account of the uh, beer strike in Ontario. One Hamilton man who shuffled off to Buffalo to pick up a couple of six-packs got his comeuppance, but at least he, unlike many others, was able to kiss his beer goodbye. A Canadian beer drinking tradition is disappearing fast, and the first place they're feeling it is in the Maritimes. What's vanishing are those squat and stubby dark brown bottles. The Canadian brewery industry has spent millions of dollars to make the change to long neck bottles, and part of that cost is a result of scenes like this. There's no doubt that Cape Bretoners have done their part to support the brewery industry, and some wonder why the beer couldn't have found its way to a charitable cause. It's a beer drinker's lament. 700 cases of supposedly good brew down the drain, so to speak. Brewers say the change was inevitable. Light beer has become popular, and American beer, and twist-off caps. I find when you're drinking it that uh, it foams up more. But most beer drinkers have adjusted. Oh, as long as the beer's still there. Specialty brewers are on the hop these days, rushing to cash in on more relaxed liquor laws. Now that Canadian liquor laws are changing, new breweries are springing up all over. There's one in the back of this pub in Kingston, Ontario. But the idea of drinking the stuff that's made in the back room is catching on. It's got a hell of a lot more body than Canadian beer, I'll tell you that. It's very smooth, it's very easy to drink. Okay, Ernie, if you could pitch your yeast there. Ernie Knudsen has been coming to this so-called U-Brew store for about three years. It's easy and it's cheap. Making your own beer and wine in British Columbia is virtually tax-free. You can brew a dozen bottles here for about $10. Buying it at the liquor store would cost $15. For the working men, yes, it's the working people, the working class people, it's a way better deal. Most hours have 60 minutes. This hour has seven days. Tonight, Ralph Nader charges the Detroit car companies with running risks that can't hurt them, but do hurt us. I could give an example of the Buick Roadmaster from 1953. The one with power brakes came onto the market, many thousands of them, with a defective braking system. Now... You mean in, in the 53 Buick Roadmaster, with power a brakes. driver would literally go from normal brakes to no brakes like that's that? Right, that's right. This is documented in court records which is very interesting. It shows you that the only way we find out about these things is through the cumbrous process of the judicial uh, uh, system. So what you want to do is make an overwhelming systematic case to overcome the resistance of industry. The stronger a case you make, the more scientists you have uh, working on the project uh, on an independent, objective basis, the more overpowering the forces of humane automotive technology will be.
Well, across California, they are still cleaning up. Weeks of heavy rains caused severe flooding and mass evacuations in some places. Dealing with all that water is messy work, and it's dramatically different from what people have been coping with in recent years. A drought of historic proportions when saving every drop possible was the goal. Still, no one knows for sure if those dry days are finally over. Kim Brunhuber reports. As you see, that is the level. That's how high the water rose last week outside Hien Nguyen's house. Everything destroyed, all gone. Inside, the flood filled her bathtub. The house smells like a wet sock that's been left in the washer for a week. Yes, Nguyen's aware of the irony. After six years of saving every drop of water, she's now among hundreds living in a shelter because floods ravaged Northern California, threatening dams like the one in Oroville. Now, Nguyen says, at least one thing is certain. We no longer have the drought. Just look at this map. Last year, about 95% of the state experienced drought. The darker the color, the worse it was. This year, it's down to about 17%. So, does that mean California's historic drought is finally over? Surface water drought is definitely over. At least in terms of the amount of water stored above ground. Almost all the major reservoirs in the state are at or well above average for this time of year. The Sierra Nevada snowpack, which provides a third of the state's water, is at historically high levels. That's why the spring projection shows the drought-stricken areas shrinking to this tiny brown patch bordering Mexico. But some insist the drought, you still can't say it's gone. No, it's not over. Underground aquifers provide up to 46% of the state's water supply. Think of it as California's liquid bank account. The state's driest areas, especially where there's lots of farming, have spent most of the last 17 years withdrawing water and only three years depositing. Getting the groundwater levels back in the black will take a lot more than just one wet winter. We need in many areas three, four, five of those to really replenish our groundwater resources to where they were before this last drought. Drought and flood have always been part of life in California, but many scientists expect both to occur more frequently, which means the state may have to change the way it stores water. Right now, even when the state is overflowing with water, much of it just disappears. A lot of it is simply running off into our estuaries and into the ocean. There are already almost 3,000 dams and reservoirs in California, so instead of building more, experts say they should be altered. So we can perhaps take some of that additional flood water and actually actively put it into groundwater storage. In May, the governor will announce whether the drought is officially over and set the water restriction targets for the year ahead. Convincing Californians to conserve when they're dealing with more water than they can handle might be hard, but Feldman says it's vital. The time to plan for droughts is when you're not in one. Drought, no drought, Nien doesn't care what officials label it, as long as they beef up flood protection measures so this doesn't happen again. Uh, look at this, I can't figure out how can I survive after. But I am a brave woman. <laughs> Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, San Jose, California. Coming up, the man who would be king, well, maybe in Middle Earth. Let's check the business numbers. It was an arrows down day for the markets. The TSX dropped 63 points. The dollar fell almost four tenths of a cent. In New York, the Dow lost 112 points. The price of oil closed down $1.22 a barrel. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, while Pope Francis preaches a church of humility and charity, a group of his detractors in the church is becoming more vocal in criticizing his vision. That's on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. have never seen anything like it around the Lincoln Memorial or for that matter anywhere else here in the capital of the United States. We lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time. This park area on the Washington Mall right underneath the Capitol Dome has been the gathering place for many demonstrations. 
but none quite so strange as this collection of uniformed veterans, complete with medals and toy machine guns. The anti-war movement in this country is an ever-changing phenomenon. You never know quite what to expect next. William H. Carroll from Atlanta, Georgia. 26 air medals and all the other stuff that goes with it. Washington was the scene today of the largest anti-nuclear demonstration ever held in the U.S. If you're not building for the future, you're stealing from it. They call the Supreme Court decision a tragic mistake. And on this, the 10th anniversary of legalized abortions, 26,000 marchers vowed to begin a second decade of protest. Organizers are calling it the biggest pro-choice rally in history. We will never give up. We will never give up. We will never give in. We will never give in. From Capitol Hill to the Washington Monument, they formed an awesome mass of people. Not the million and a half the organizers claimed, but the largest ever gathering of black Americans. We are not here to tear down America. America is tearing itself down. We are here to rebuild the wasted cities. This was exactly the image organizers wanted, a pageant of Americans before a national icon. Summoned by a political commentator and a champion of conservatives. This day is a day that we can start the heart of America again. Look around you, you're not alone. You are Americans. The National. <laughs> The National. Tonight. Alexis and I need the car, and I'm pretty sure parents are supposed to put their children before themselves. If airplane safety videos have taught me anything, David, it's that a mother puts her own mask on first. Tom Hanks has lived up to his nice guy reputation again. He got a new espresso machine for the White House press corps, the third one he's sent over the years. He also sent a typewritten note, keep up the good fight for truth, justice, and the American way, especially for the truth part. Another noble letter, at least, claiming to be noble. This ad in the Times of London, in it a Colorado man named Alan V. Evans, says he's the rightful heir to the British throne. He says he comes from third century Welsh royalty and that he'll make Britain great once again. He also included a few Lord of the Rings references and says he's even willing to let the Queen live out her reign before he takes over. Nice guy. That's The National this Thursday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.